on and um, continue on in our series of Solus Christus this morning, Christ Alone, which has seen us working through uh, the book of Colossians. And I don't know about you guys, but I have loved this series and the timing of it. Um, God has really spoken to us through this book as a church. And um, and I think it just is a great uh, reminder of the season that we're in and how God is a part of that um, for today as, as a nation and as a world. And I believe that today's scripture is going to continue in the same fashion of speaking to us. But first, let's um, pray together. God, we thank you for your word and, um, and how we can come together and learn so much and be reminded that in all things and in all seasons that you are God. And we pray that this morning to, um, that you will open our ears to hear what it is that you want us to hear and ultimately um, that our love and understanding of you will grow. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get stuck in. We are going to be uh, reading the first couple of verses and we're in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. It says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. And if we remember, Paul is writing all of this from his jail cell. So when he says he's in chains, he is literally in chains. And I think it's somewhat of a unique prayer request uh, from a jail cell. I don't think it would be my prayer request from jail. But Paul is asking the Colossian church to not just pray, but be devoted to prayer, devoted to praying for doors to open for him to share the gospel message from jail. I was reminded um, of this story this week of a gentleman by the name of Pablo Casals, who was a famous cellist, uh, composer and conductor, and he was most famous for his work in the 1930s. And um, at the age of 93 years old, he would still practice his cello for three hours a day. And when he was asked why he continued to practice his cello for three hours a day, he replied, I'm beginning to notice some improvement. I think I'm making some progress. And at the, nine, at the age of 93 years of age, sorry, he still had an attitude that he could make progress, that he wasn't done yet. And we see this similar attitude in Paul. He's kind of in a hopeless looking situation. And uh, I'm sure being in jail wasn't part of his plan when he set out to share the gospel with the world. But he still believed that God could do something and that he could still make progress from jail. And so Paul is encouraging this community as he writes to, um, writes to the church of Colossae, he's encouraging them from a personal and a private faith to a life that reflects Jesus to others. Why? For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of eternity. That's what's at stake. It's said in the Bible and is still so true today that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And this is what drives Paul and still continues to drive him from his prison cell. Throughout um, the book of Acts, we see how Paul's life was led and impacted through prayer and fasting and worship. And we find Paul being led by the Spirit time and time again. And so I want to take us to one particular instance in Acts. Paul, um, just to give you a context, Paul was planning to visit and strengthen the churches that he had planted in the Asian province of Galatia during his first journey. And after that, he had planned to take uh, the gospel to the unchurched regions. And so Paul, who was traveling with Silas and Timothy, had plans to head directly west uh, where they came across a couple of Asian borders and found that the spirit of the Lord kept stopping them and not letting them cross these borders. We don't know the details of this, but they attempted a couple of times at different points on the border and somehow the Spirit made it clear to them that they were to not cross the border into Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. And so we pick up this story in verses 9 and 10 in Acts chapter 16. And it says, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. They were so sensitive 
to the leading of the Holy Spirit in their lives as their guides that Paul has this dream and because of their obedience, the next day they're off to Macedonia. Once they arrived in Macedonia, they'd been there a couple of days and we pick up the story again in verses 13 and 14. And it says, On the Sabbath they went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Lydia is believed to be uh, the first convert in Europe. And they saw so many other conversions and through some very unique circumstances and planted a couple of churches in Philippi, Thessalonica and Corinth. And because of this, the history of the church and the world was forever changed because of this. Talk about an adventure. A real adventure. For Paul, he was living this godly adventure. Every move that he made, he made with God and for God. And this devotion to prayer was what guided his way. And I think that we can make a really good plan for what devotion to prayer looks like. You know, you can get up early, you can spend hours praying and throughout the day. But there's something that comes before this. And I believe until we capture the adventure of life with God, with God, we won't have a drive or a desire to devote ourselves to prayer. And I was reflecting on this um, this week and recall as a child, I would often um, think about my parents and, and the job and how they chose a life working for the church. But at the same time, how adventurous their life was. You know, the things that they got to do and be involved in, um, like was still mind boggling to me. You know, in many respects, it didn't make any sense. I mean, they're church workers, like as far as a career is concerned, if you pick the most boring one, right? But at the same time, because of the um, opportunities that God presented to them and that they took up, their life was an adventure. And I think about my own life in my 30s, and even though there's only been around 15 years or so of life as an adult, I have had um, such an adventurous life because of God, because I have allowed God to guide my choices. At the age of 17, after a trip to Europe, I stopped in to see some family on the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And through a series of circumstances, I found myself being offered an internship at a church there. And so I came back to New Zealand for two weeks and managed to convince my darling parents um, that I was going to pack up my life and move over there. And um, I'm not sure how many parents would be happy with their 17-year-old daughter moving countries, but thankfully my parents understood a godly adventure. And um, so I interned at a church over there for a couple of years. I then re-entered the workforce and I got married to a young man by the name of Carl. And as many of you will be aware, um, he ended up getting leukaemia and we spent 12 months in hospital and um, in the leukaemia village as well in Brisbane Uh, before he passed away. It was an adventure, not necessarily a fun one, but one that God was still a part of. Even after Carl passed away and everything that I had originally envisaged for my future was just so cloudy and honestly, like I wasn't sure what my future held, I'd received a phone call um, about 10 days after Carl had died um, from one of my old bosses and he offered me a job and uh, I decided to take it. And so a month later, I was back working and uh, which for me was the best move. The achiever in me just needed something to give me um, a reason to get up every day and give me a sense of purpose. Um, That job, in fact, found me in rooms uh, with everything from environmental ministers, finance ministers, to presidents and prime ministers from all around the world. And um, there was this one day when I was at work and I'm watching like Barack Obama, Vladimir Putin, Angela Merkel, Salman, the crown prince from Saudi Arabia, David Cameron, the list goes on, all just walking past. And I know it sounds like I'm totally name name dropping, but I found myself almost laughing because I was like, I'm 26, don't know a lot. How on earth did I get here? 
I doubt that um, that moment will ever be repeated in my life. But by this crazy turn of events, I was doing this job and at the same time just working through my intense grief. But again, the adventures didn't stop there. I came back to New Zealand and I had intended to move to Auckland, um, but due to a severely broken leg, I ended up remaining in Tauranga, hanging out with old mom pa. And uh, there was a mission evening that was held here at BBC. And after hearing Luke Fryer talk about the work that they did in Fiji with Buller Coffee, I wanted to help. So again, a few weeks later, I uh, went to visit them and see what it was that they were all about. And after spending three weeks in Fiji, I came back home for a couple of weeks and went back and spent uh, all up another nine months in Fiji. Again, there were these moments of total surprise as to what my life was, attending church in a language that I didn't understand, uh, learning about coffee. And there were moments where I'd be wading through waist and chest high water uh, to Cross um, to get to a remote village uh, where I would meet with a chief and their families to chat to them about the wild coffee growing in their village and how we could partner together. For the girl from Tauranga, this was an adventure. From here, I came back to New Zealand again, not sure what life would present with itself, and I got asked to fill in uh, for a few months for a role here at church. And so since then, in varying capacity, since 2016, I've worked in youth and integration, local mission and young adults. And trust me, (laughs) it's an adventure. Sometimes a very random one as God leads me and this church into different things and brings people into our world um, because we have chosen to and allow God to interrupt our lives for His purpose. Because God is the compass. And when your life is guided by God, the compass, you are driven to pray. You you find yourself devoted to prayer. We've, um, We've talked a lot about the third way in this series, but we can also choose a third lens. We can choose what lens we're going to look through in terms of our life. We can choose a lens that looks like, looks at our life and hopes only for the highlights. You know, I lived in Aussie near one of the most beautiful beaches. I uh, got married, have worked in some unique jobs, lived in Fiji, now work serving Jesus. It's the Instagram version. Or we can look at our lives through a lens of misery, uh, having had a husband that died at 25 years, I struggled with depression, broken leg that limited my options for six to eight months, glandular fever, the many, many times uh, that I have been so unsure of my future. You know, where we think that the adventure is over or say we don't want this adventure anymore and we just tap out. Or we can look at our lives through a third lens. A third option, a godly lens that shows that that shows through all of the good and the bad that God has been faithful. That He, with Him as my compass guiding my way, it is an adventure. And with those lenses on, I tell you, I am left to just being so, so impressed by God. Impressed by the opportunities and the people that I have met and what God has done in my life and in so many others around me. But being continuously impressed by who God is is what drives my devotion to Him. And Paul is so passionate about what he is doing that, and what God is doing. Even whilst he writes from this jail cell, he sees the adventure that he is on with God. And so he's passionately inviting others to pray with, in, with him and into it. Like pray into my adventure. God is doing things. Pray for the sake of the gospel. It's an adventure. And life is an adventure and one that we can choose to have led by God. All right, I want to continue on in our passage today in Colossians um, chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. And it says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I know for a lot of people that last line in that verse brings a lot of fear so that you may know how to answer everyone. But this isn't actually something to be afraid of. 
Paul isn't saying here, you better know your way around the hot debated topics for our time. You know all the ins and outs of science and apologetics. And these are all good things, but our lives are what becomes the megaphone, the megaphone for Christ and the gospel. Our lives show the answer. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, so through Jesus. And by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And this scripture is saying that we cannot be defeated when we confess our faith in Jesus. Because our salvation, our strength and our security is found in Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, solus Christus. Our testimony, or rather the testimony of what God has done in our life and continues to do, is something that cannot be taken away from us. The wisdom and grace that Paul is talking about here is knowing when to say something and how to say it and knowing you don't have to win every battle. It's coming from a place of kindness and ultimately humility. Our personal testimony, our witness, our conversation is to be full of grace, seasoned with salt. I, uh, I love to eat good food, and quite honestly, I love, I love salt. Um, I love a good salted hot chip from the fish and chip store who's with me. Oh, more chip takers in the first service. Um, but look, I love to always, I love to cook good food. A happy place for me is in the kitchen all going well. Um, and probably because I just, like I said, enjoy eating as well. But salt has a couple of different uses when it comes to food. Uh, less common nowadays, but salt was historically used as a preservative to prevent meat from decaying. But if we're talking about it as a seasoning, it takes on a bit of a different meaning. Uh, there's a book called, and a, it's a popular Netflix series called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. And it talks about how these four elements are the basis for creating great food. And the author of this book talks about how salt um, not only enhances flavour, but salt has a greater impact on flavour than any other ingredient. It is like the boss of flavouring. And so when it comes to our conversation, like salt in a dish, it has a huge effect on those who hear it. See, the message and hope of Christ, the gospel, this message doesn't change. But there are countless ways as to how to serve that meal. And we just need some wisdom as to how to serve it. You know, when uh, people are describing a dish and... Um, particularly if you're hungry and they describe it so well and your mouth just starts to water and you just like wish that that meal could be right in front of you, right there, right, just real. You just want it now. It tastes, sounds so good. Well, let me remind you, there are a lot of hungry people out there and we can talk about Christ and our relationship with him in a way that makes people's mouths water that it's a dish that they want to taste, that they want to be real for them, then and there. Or we can serve up a really bland dish. And nobody gets excited about joining something that's boring and mundane. You know, it's statistically proven that unbelievers describe Christians as boring. But let me tell you something. Jesus was many things, but boring wasn't one of them. Boring people don't have 5,000 people turn up to hear their message. Boring people aren't asked at weddings to make the party better. Boring people aren't greeted with palm branches when they enter a city and boring people don't change the world. Our God is not boring. The world literally altered its calendar to centre around the life of Jesus. BC and AD, Jesus was anything but boring. And Paul is saying here, season your words with salt. Preserve the message of God, but show off its flavour. Show your passion for Jesus. Show the amazing things that God has done in your life. Uh, being pregnant and food not always agreeing with me at the moment, when I cook dinner, I find myself asking others to taste test the meals, and um, particularly when I'm adding salt, because... It's really hard to salt your meal when you haven't been enjoying the taste yourself. 
And the same goes for our relationship with God. It's really, really hard to salt your speech and hard to share the excitement and flavour of Jesus when you haven't been enjoying God's company yourself. You have to taste it. Otherwise, it's just a bland old time. At best, you know, at best you might be able to reminisce or make your best attempt, um, but it's a different ball game when you have just tasted something great and can share that with others and share the Jesus adventure with others because it's too easy to forget. Forget how good and how great and how powerful and how wonderful our God is. But there's another side to salt, isn't there? When you put too much in. Oh my goodness. Have you ever put too much salt in a dish? It is horrendous. It is unpalatable and you don't want to eat it. I um, was had dinner one evening at a very fancy restaurant on the Gold Coast for an event. And the dish served um, came out so salty that I just couldn't eat it. I decided that I would rather remain hungry uh, than try and gulp down this meal. It was just no appeal and it was so disappointing. And again, the same goes with our faith, where we oversalt it and attempt to make it so flavoursome and so exciting and tasty that we end up ruining the dish. We ruin the meal that we want others to enjoy and that they're actually hungry for. What do I mean? Well, it's when we are so afraid of what people might think about the message and the hope of Jesus that we try so hard to oversell it overflavor it and try to make this beautiful gospel fit people's current lives. It's an attempt to make it palatable and tasty and the gospel becomes, as um, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, it's a gospel that doesn't require any change or transformation of the heart. It's a gospel that offers forgiveness without repentance, communion without confession, blessings without relationship and prayer, and it cheapens what God did on the cross. And the irony in it all is that this oversalted gospel has no decent flavour or depth. It's unpalatable and it doesn't taste good to anyone. People don't want this dish and they would rather go hungry. They'd rather go hungry. So what are we to do? How do we get this seasoning right? It's about reminding yourself every day why the gospel tastes good to you. Some who have been Christians for so long neglect to even enjoy Christ. And then when someone comes along and you have the opportunity to speak to them about Jesus, you're not compelling anyone. If we are to make the most of every opportunity, we need to be prepared by spending time with Christ. Honestly, um, there are times in my life where I have made the most of every opportunity and sometimes where I haven't. And sometimes the difference has been whether or not I've had something to lose. There was a, a doctor, an oncologist called Emil Freirich in the 1950s. And he was assigned to care for children in the leukemia ward, a job that no one wanted. Uh, particularly at that time, uh, the disease was horrific. Um, it was a horrible illness and it was a death sentence in that most of the children only lived uh, for eight weeks post their diagnosis and 99% of them died within the first year. At the same time, another um, difficult-to-treat disease, tuberculosis, had recently been cured. And so this doctor believed that a similar approach might work for leukaemia as well. And they knew that these three drugs combined together um, controlled tuberculosis. And so, but you had to administer them all at once, separately and one by one. They didn't work. And so he began the chemo, um, combining the chemo drugs instead of giving them one at a time. And other people in his profession said, said to him, you know, look, you're acting unethically, you know, this is inhumane, it's going to kill the children. But he knew that they had nothing to lose. You know, a few weeks, these children would otherwise be dead. And what ended up happening was that 90% of these children went into remission immediately with his combined chemotherapy drugs. 90%. And to this day, we still use the same approach with chemotherapy. 
But you think of the things that can happen when we have nothing to lose. And this has been my experience when I honestly felt like I have had nothing to lose, when everything in my life has been stripped away and it's just me and God, I have found that I have taken up more opportunities to pray with people and share my faith because I have nothing to lose. But there are other times in my life where I think, um, and I'm sure you can all relate, where we've found it harder to share the gospel because mainly in our minds, we perceive that we might have something to lose. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to lose our social status amongst our peers or our co-workers and our fear and pride, those quiet gospel killers take over. And it becomes too many moments of wasted or missed opportunities. Guys, when did we start approaching the gospel so selfishly? When did we decide the things that we have, our pride, our jobs, our finances, some friendships, our taking care of ourselves to the nth degree or our unwillingness to sacrifice our bad habits or our bad attitudes, when did we decide that these things were more important than the message of hope, life and eternity, the message of Jesus? Because if it's not me sharing, then who? One of the things that the devil wants us to do is keep our fears in the dark, convincing us that we are the only one with this problem or fear. We think that we have to graduate to talking to others about Jesus and that it has to be this really big and intimidating thing. But more often than not, it's just the simple moments in life that we lack courage in. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthian church, Uh, chapter three, verse seven, says it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. For me, it's about reminding myself to be bold in the little moments. It's as simple as when I'm chatting to my hairdresser about the Netflix series called God and sharing about my work and my faith in Jesus. It's after church when I'm eating at the local Indian restaurant and the waiter asks where we've been and I say church and we just, we just have a bit of church chat. Don't see these moments as wasteful or not worth your time. It's all planting and watering. This is a um, picture. I'm not sure how well you can see it. Uh, it's taken after a London bombing during World War II, the London Blitz. And the sign on this made me laugh. It says, fags and beer, we are all here. Now, look, I'm not advocating for a life of fags and beer, but this sign and these people, as they were putting up their flags, whilst they're obviously in a mess around them and a crazy time for London and the world, they have a great attitude. You know, they're saying in this chaos, we are still open for business. We're still open for business. And I know that so many things in the world at the moment look a bit chaotic, but my hope is that we can be reminded or ensure that we are open for business, for God's business. And for you, that chaos might be, um, or that riot outside might be COVID, it might be family, work, finances, health, a myriad of things, but as Christians, we are called to be open for business. Christianity isn't a private religion lived internally and um, in the safety of your mind, but it is lived in partnership with other believers in the public sphere, despite the chaos. And we don't do this, do this alone. Just as Paul was encouraging this community to devote themselves to prayer for themselves and for each other, we're not meant to do it by ourselves either. We are to devote ourselves to prayer, be devoted to praying for each other for opportunities to share the gospel, devoted to praying for each other that we might be able to proclaim it clearly and with an abundance of grace and wisdom. Because life with God is an adventure. Sometimes we are not quite sure what direction you're heading in. It's all a bit unknown or sometimes it's a fun adventure with a lot of happiness and joy, but sometimes it's an unexpected journey. But it's all an adventure and one that God so desires to be the compass that guides and leads us. When we read Paul's words saying, pray for me, Paul would never, ever 
ever in his wildest dreams have known that 2,000 years later that we would be reading those same words and be encouraged by them. Never. I'm sure of it. But that is the nature of God and sharing the gospel is that it can leave a lasting impact for generations. God wants us to be open for business. His business. For the sake of the gospel and for the sake of others. Open for business. Why don't you all stand and we're going to pray together this morning. Father God, we thank you that you gave your son Jesus, that you made a way for us to come to know you. And uh, my prayer is that together we can have an attitude where we are open for business, open to serving those around us and that boldness, God, regardless of what chaos we find ourselves in the midst of. That we can firstly be reminded of how good the gospel tastes so that we can share the mouth-watering hope of you with others. And God, as Paul asked the Colossian church to pray for opportunities to share the gospel, that we will have eyes to see the opportunities and know that we have nothing to lose in sharing our faith because, God, it is you alone, Christ alone that saves. Christ alone. And God, for that we are eternally grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to close our service here. But if for any reason you guys want prayer, um, we have a prayer team that up the front here or we pray with your people you came with. Um, take the time to consider your life at this time and if God is acting as your compass. You know, whether you need to re-surrender or reconsider a life where you're compelled to share the gospel where the message of Christ tastes good. I encourage you, don't leave the moment. Have that reflection time.